Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined today by a very special duo to talk about a very special topic. I'm, I'm mega excited. I've been mega excited to talk about this since I, um, since I beat it. We're here to talk about Twisted Metal, the 1995 PS1 North American launch game. And we're here with David Jaffe, who is the designer and really the lead mind behind this game. Jaffe, welcome to the show, my friend. Good to see you. Always good to see you guys. I, I pretty wow. That's not that's uh, very professional. The way you just responded. I, <laughs> um, that's a first for Jaffe. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jesus. don't you fucking push me. <laughs> don't you test me. I got a bag of tricks just waiting. I know. I know. And Gene yeah. Parker, the Washington Post, and of course, punching up. Welcome to the show. I, I was so excited you wanted to do this with me because I think I had mentioned it to you or something. And uh, I don't know how, but I was like, yeah, of course, Gene Park. We got to get Gene Park on. I want the more the merrier. Welcome to the show. Yeah, no, I was listening to uh, Sacred Symbols and That's you invited uh, Chris and Dustin, and I was like, those kids don't know, no, they about, don't know shit. Uh, about the twist of metal, you know? I, like, so it's like, yeah, I was there, man. So I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here to, to speak to uh, history's first video game auteur. David Scott Jaffe. Yeah, that's not true. But what I will tell you is I do get sometimes a little pissed off when the press made up of people, you know, who were sperm uh, when Twisted Metal came out. They're like, Overwatch is the first hero shooter ever. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and I'm like, well, I don't know about that. I think Twisted Metal might, you know, have a little bit to say about that and a couple other games as well. You know what? Yeah, you're right. I know. I know. I'm just like, you know, but I... uh, I uh, it'll, it'll be fun to talk about because I know they just dropped on PS mm-hmm. Plus. Yeah, you can buy it a la carte as well, which is what I did. But it's on yeah. PS Plus Premium, so if Premium. you have that, that okay. highest tier, I don't it, the subscription models totally stress me out. Just like I got to play it, so I just it was ten bucks. I was like, fine, I'm gonna buy Twisted Metal, and I want to talk right. about that in a minute about how I even came to it. But sure. I thought you'd find this funny at the top, Jaffe. I just talked to John Garvin. That show doesn't go up yet. This will actually go up first. But we were talking about Trace War and some of the other stuff. And I was mm-hmm. telling him that I was watching Twisted Metal on TV. I've only seen the first three episodes. I like it so yep. far. Me too. It's great. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know if the if the credits are going too fast at the end, but I had to tell you that I don't think I saw your name in the credits and that fucking pisses me off. And I, I told I told John Garvin that when the Days Gone movie or whatever comes out and they inevitably don't credit him either. Right. Um, that's going to also preemptively piss me off. So I just wanted to say that at the top. I think that that's totally disrespectful. Like I remember at the end of God of War 2018, your name's in it. You know? Well, as a special thanks or something. Yeah, which is better than not like nothing. Right? <laughs> sure. I, mean, I, I, I you know it didn't bother me one bit. I mean, a lot of people ask me, you know, I, I love the show. I thought it was great. I binged it uh, the first couple days it was out. Uh, I, I was sucker punched that it was as good as it was. I, I'm a fan of the people who made it. I love Cobra Kai. I think Cobra Kai is just the best, mm. you know, and the, the twist metal was show run by one of the writers and producers of Cobra Kai and then the Deadpool guys and all that stuff. Um, but I still, you know, they had released enough crap that was like, in terms of trailers, I was like, this trailer looks terrible. This is going to be a shit show. And uh, I was just like, Oh my God, this is not just like not terrible, but this is pretty entertaining. And uh, so I, I was really pleased about that, but I, I did not have any issues being credited. I mean, they asked me to do a cameo. I didn't want to fly down to New Orleans to do it. Um, that would have been awesome. I would have loved to see awesome. it. <laughs> I, I want to do it in season two, but it was COVID and all that shit. Oh, I'm like, I want to get on okay, a plane sure. and... Sure. And, and plus, it means if I go to New Orleans, it means I have to leave my house. Um, I and that's, you know, come I, on. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Uh, but but what I was going to say, though, is that it uh, the credits, man. I mean, first off, there's so many people. I mean, again, I'm not I'm not doing lip service. You guys know this. There's so many people who make a game. And I was and remain sort of the one of the front men with Scott Campbell and and while absolutely my DNA and my essence this sounds so gross is all over that game <laughs> um, in that franchise, it, I, I think if you're not going to credit me and Scott and Kellen, uh, it, it becomes disrespectful in that way. Mm. But I also think, frankly, people are like Jeffy, did you get royalties and all this? And they're stunned that I don't. But I'm like, 
it, that was just never the relationship. And so I, I'm not like one of these comic book writers that was promised by Stan Lee. No, you'll, you know, come on, true believer. You'll get what you just, you know, whatever he said, I don't fucking know. Uh, you know, for me, it was like Sony hired me. They gave me all these toys to play with. They gave me pretty much creative freedom. They paid me great money, great bonuses, great insurance, uh, medical insurance and all that. So, you know, and it was never, a thought that this was mine as an intellectual property that I should continue to profit off of. Would I love that? Sure. I remember I asked Shuhei once because Twisted Metal was sitting dormant as an IP for a long time at Sony. And I said, hey, can I just have it? And he says, he just looks at me with that very shoe way. And he's just like, no, you fucking idiot. Why are you an idiot? You know, like, no, okay, whatever. But no, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I hear you. It would have been nice to have a credit, but that's just ego. I, 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 I'm, I'm thrilled the game. And the more importantly, the IP is still out there doing work for us. I, the thing that blew my mind the most was after watching the show, was this idea that maybe, you know, it's sitting at like a 70% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's like a 94% uh, audience rating, uh, over a thousand people. And I'm like, you know, okay, so, you know, the thing that it was the first time I ever thought about legacy, right? Because I've never been a guy that cares about legacy. I don't think about it all that much. People ask me. Um, but now I'm like, okay, this could actually continue whether the, it gets two more seasons, then it gets canceled. And then that inspires somebody. And in 20 years, they make a movie, you know, you never, you know, I could be dead and gone. And this and or Kratos are still kind of out there representing. I think that's really cool. Yeah. That's the first time it really hit me that I'm like, this is stuff that even though we don't benefit financially in my family, my kids, my grandkids, whatever, it's like, oh, that was, that's the thing grandpa helped with. I think that's kind of cool. No, it definitely is. And Jeffy, turn your volume down, just a, your your input down just a little bit. You turn your input down. If you don't mind, just a tad bit. Uh, like the top me, left knob there. Yeah. Just a How bit. How's that? That's good. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So I want to preface this. Gene, did you hear when Collins told me to turn my input down and I said, you turn your input down? I did, yeah. It, Wasn't it that was, awesome? It was a little spicy. Yeah. It's, like a, sh- it's like a shower fight. Dirt, Gene, I don't put up with this shit. <laughs> All right. You're being silenced or your input is being... <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. All right. Let's... Um, I want to preface this and then I want to jump in and I want to get everyone's... You know, I want to get Gene. I want to get your experience in here with this because <clears throat> you're a little older than me. When the PS1 launched, I was in middle school. And my brother, Dagan, obviously we all know Dagan. He's 11 years older than me. He bought it. He wanted Battle Arena Toshin Den because he's a big mm-hmm. fighting nerd. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. And Twisted Metal was a game I just didn't, I just didn't understand it. And then I remember playing it at a friend's house or rent, you know, and renting it and all of that. But I was really into Japanese role-playing games and like just different shit. So Twisted Metal really never spoke to me when I was a kid. It just never, I don't know why, it just didn't speak to me. A lot of that kind of stuff. I think the multiplayer aspect of it too was not a huge turn on for me because I like playing games really by myself. So Twisted Metal kind of just went along. And before you know it, and I'm very much like this, if I am not connected, it's like Assassin's Creed. If I'm not connected with the series from the beginning, I'm like, I'm not jumping in now. So by the time, like, let's say Twisted Metal 2012 came out or something, I'm like, I'm so far gone. I have no idea what's going on. Um, I'm going to, you know, accompany people on preview events or whatever, but you don't want me to write about this. You don't want me to obviously do the review and all the rest. And so the show obviously comes out from Peacock. And accompanying the show, like we said earlier, Twisted Metal 1 and 2, the PS1 games, uh, are launched on PSN, which is a really nice surprise as part of PS Plus and again, a la carte. And I had just beaten Final Fantasy 3 because Dagan and I are going through all the pixel remasters again for knockback. And I was going on the PSN store as I often do, and I was just clicking around and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to buy Twisted Metal and play it. And I played it and then I played it for like the next three days. I platinumed it. I think it's my 145th platinum trophy. And I was so interested in it from a genetic you know speaking of gross um genes being all over something the genetics of it i could see you in the game and i also just felt like it was so interesting because it's an inflection point along with those 3do games and stuff in the mid 90s where things were starting to move Mm -hmm. in this other direction something that made me at the time feel very much left behind as like my mario mario fan colin and Mm -hmm. final fantasy 3 colin and i didn't really know what i was looking at and i was totally fascinated and smitten with it and i think it's a really cool game it's hard as hell in my opinion, mm-hmm. I was really bad at it. Um, I was also using the analog stick, which it obviously wasn't designed for. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I yeah, just picked it up recently, and and uh, I I forgot that it was that analog stick was never there. So mm-hmm. I was like, oh yeah, you got to use a D pad. And once you use a D pad, it's like, oh, the game actually makes sense now. You know. Mm-hmm. So I beat it with every character. I did cheat to get to the. Uh, okay. I beat it like all the way through with Sweet Tooth and one other character, the truck, the big truck, because you take so much damage. And then right. Outlaw, I think that is. And yeah. then um, I went and just. Thing. And just use the passwords to beat the game over and over again with all the different characters to see their endings. Okay. And uh, I don't know. I just I, I became it was fun, funny to me. I became much better at it as I played it, obviously. And you know what it reminded me of? You said hero shooter, Jaffe, which is so interesting because I didn't think about it that way. You know what I thought mm-hmm. about it as a fighting game? That's like, how that was what we thought yeah. it was. Doom. We, we were inspired by Mario Kart <clears throat> Battle Mode, Doom and Mortal Kombat. Those mm-hmm. those were the things that we put in the gumbo. Uh and kind of outpoured twisted metal. So uh, we always looked at it as a fighting game in cars. Mm -hmm. And so when we were creating the characters, there were two criteria. One was to create every vehicle had to sort of fit with a personality of a player who might like to play this way or that way or the other way. And the other was, you know, the balance between the vehicles and making sure, I don't think we got it just right, but in the multiplayer that, everybody could beat everybody else. And the multiplayer really came online towards the very end. So we didn't have a lot of time to tune it. Um, it was never meant to be a multiplayer game, which ended up really being the bread and butter of that series. So that's so interesting. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of one of those serendipitous things. Gene, what about you? What was your first experience with Twisted Metal? Did Were you into it at the time contemporary to it? And because uh, even returning to it, I had said this about Wild Arms 2, which was a game I really loved when I was a kid. I went and replayed it and platinumed it when it came to PSN. And I didn't remember one fucking frame of that game. <laughs> When I when I was playing it, so when I was playing cool. Twisted Metal, which is a game I would remember much less, it was really a new and fresh experience for me. So, mm-hmm. what uh, what's your experience with the original? Yeah, so I was there on uh, like most IP. Uh, I was there on day one uh, from the ground floor. Uh, you know, I, I I just like Dagan, I wanted to play PlayStation because you know Battle Arena Toshinden, a three D fighter with swords. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? That's crazy. Like, who who the fuck knows? Who? I, I I still don't even know who made the game, right? Um, I couldn't tell you. I, and I, yeah, who did make it? I don't know. I, I, I think it was like and former Street Namco? Fighter folks uh, that 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 left, which you know kind of explains why the game feels kind of tight or whatever. Um, and so I bought a PlayStation, and then Twisted Metal is just one of the first games that uh, that that came out uh, uh, during launch. And I played it, and I loved it. I played the hell out of it, and I played it so much with my with my little sister because we were always into like like multiplayer games and and, and fighting games. So that's why, like, I, I think it's great to hear. That Twisted Metal was kind of designed after a fighting game and a, a Doom game because that's kind of like what I felt like. Because at that time, I already have, I already had played Doom and I was like, this is kind of like Doom Deathmatch with the little yeah. uh, the, the item pickups. You know, it's the same thing. You the, the, you want to get the shot the, the, the shotgun, you want to get the uh, the, the heat seeking ro- uh, uh, rockets over there in the map. So again and again, it was like one really one of the first three D games, and I re- remember my favorite levels were the, the night city areas and the suburb areas because mm-hmm. i had always been dreaming of a game like grand theft auto and when i played oh, twisting right, metal right. i was like this is kind of like that so i just really enjoyed just driving around the, the maps and i think one of the criticisms you can levy against twisted metal is that, that some of the maps were just a little too big and as i as i understand it twisted metal was initially developed as like one large map right or like yeah or like it a was, couple uh, large maps it was yeah if you look at in the single player now <laughs> If you look at the suburb map, mm-hmm. that the actual design for that map was maybe 20% bigger and we built it all out. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe it was streaming off the disc or anything at the time. So it was like we just couldn't fit everything into RAM. So mm-hmm. we had to kind of cut some places. But yeah, it w- I remember, man, it was we had the, the city level and suburbia is what we called it. And mm-hmm. then there was like an industrial park level and they were all massive. Mm-hmm. And that was the fantasy. It was like, are you tell? I remember going out to Utah because that was the first time I ever saw, uh, they were a company called Evans and Sutherland that did a lot of military simulators is mm-hmm. where the single track guys came from. Yeah, And they showed me all of their, not all of course, but a lot of their databases, which I had never seen 3D like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember the one that they showed me that blew my fucking mind, which was I was flying around a spaceship on Mars. Now, I mean, this is before this was 1992, 93. So maybe you had Stunt Island from Disney out on PC. You had Alone in the Dark. But short of that, the idea of 3D graphics was Doom wasn't even out yet. Yeah. 
Uh, probably well, not. Well, probably just right, right around then, you know, but yeah. But the, yeah, but the, the, I even doom though, because it was all corridors and stuff mm-hmm. and the idea of being in a database flying around Mars, I could land, I could go up. And then I remember at one point they had these floating dome cities in the database. Um, and again, they worked for the government. So chances are it was actually real. It was based on something that the government knows, but that said, it's a different topic. It's for constellations or whatever. But, um, they said, I said, Oh, that that's cool over there. And they said, Oh, we'll go to it. And I'm like, are you shitting me? And I'm like, I can fly to it. They're like, yeah, you can fly to the dome city. You can go through the dome. You can fly in between the skyscrapers and the dome. I'm like, Oh my fucking God. Right. So it was, it really was when we started mapping out twisted metal, it was, wait, you're telling me I can actually be in the city and get on a freeway, Mm -hmm. like with an on-ramp. It's Mm -hmm. not the freeway level, it's an Mm on-ramp. And then I can be on that freeway and I can get off somewhere that I can't access through city streets. They said, yeah. And Mm -hmm. I I know it sounds dumb, not dumb, but I know it sounds like to anybody who came up with 3D and came up with PlayStation, like, mm-hmm. what's the big deal? No. The big deal is before that, was that it, it, it's, yeah, it's like whenever you hear people talk about, like, Flatland and, like, oh, you can only see and live in two dimensions and you can't even comprehend that we live in a world of three dimensions. It was like that. You were used to Mario and Sonic and flat mm-hmm. screens and parallax if you were lucky to give a sense of 3D and suddenly you could live in these worlds. Mm-hmm. It was mind-blowing and i remember at the end uh we went we probably a little bit close to alpha and the game wasn't really working because it was able to be beaten very quickly Mm -hmm. and there was no multiplayer Mm -hmm. and i remembered i would i had this just massive oh my god i can remember it now i'm walking on the beach with i think it was a friend of mine in santa monica and i was just I, i mean it's almost like i'm back there right now uh i was so nervous i was so terrified by what i knew i had to do which was go we've got to chop these levels up Mm -hmm. you know and i'm like the coolest fucking thing in the world is the fact that it's these massive maps but it's not going to work as a product because Mm -hmm. it wasn't like grand theft auto where we had a thousand missions in there we just had car combat and the car combat at the time i guess was deep enough but it wasn't going to sustain uh you know that and so i remember saying other than cyberbia we got to chop all this up and make a level 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 game mm-hmm. which i just broke my heart um and there are i have a disc in here that has all the full maps i think somewhere and and uh i mean oh, it still crazy. exists but i just couldn't we could we couldn't see a way to do it so we we ended up chopping it up um and and kind of making it the way it is now but yeah it was it that's a long way to answer your wasn't it big levels yeah it used to be very very big levels mm-hmm. we had these massive maps that uh uh one of our uh designers michael jackson he, he it, it's literally his name it never gets old for me um and i'm sure he hates it but i don't care it's fun and uh he did these wonderful beautiful like architectural maps of you know they were from the military i mean they didn't go to the military but they worked with the military so they you know that's how they did it it wasn't just like you know, video game guys like, eh, let's put a building there and try, you know, it was okay. This is this grid pixel represents, you know, a third of a block, you know, or what. And it was just, just minutia of de- design. It was very impressive. Um, but yeah, they were big maps and I had big dreams of what was going to be happening in those big maps, big, big maps. But you know, the fact that we were able to do what we did and they mm-hmm. were able to get it out as a launch title or a launch window title was a fucking miracle. And I was going for like, I remember we shot video footage of like guys in uh, 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 drive through windows and we shot in suburbia these sexy girls on the other side of a fence playing with hoses and getting each other wet and stuff. And I, I was hoping... That's a Jeff that, D name, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was hoping that, and we also shot, you can find this online. Uh, if you remember the Minion, who's the bad guy at the end, the big tank, um, it's supposed to be mind controlled by this kind of uh, uh, white supremacist group called Apocalypse Nine, right? And we shot these guys and, and all of their nightmares and stuff was going to be projected onto the exterior of the tank. And I just thought, oh, because it's a disc, we can just stream all this off the disc and use it as a, 
as a big texture map. And in Utah, I was like, I don't know if we can do that, but sure, let's fucking film it and try it. And obviously we couldn't. But I, I, I saw these worlds as much more like you could pull up through a drive through mm-hmm. and then suddenly there'd be video of the guy like, hey, man, you're a nice ride and all this. Shit. All, it was that's awesome. I, you know, it was really, really cool. And then um, we we uh, uh, it, it's, it, there's so many things, man. But yeah, it was it was cool. It was a very exciting time. A, because I had never really played around in 3D and B, because it was like you really felt anything was possible. You didn't know what you didn't know. And so you felt you were going to change the fucking world with a video game. I'm cool. glad you brought up single track too, because I, yeah. I, I, along with Twisted Metal, I played Warhawk uh, mm-hmm. at launch. I fucking love that game too. I love both games. Yeah. Were, weren't they supposed to be the same game as well? Warhawk and Twisted well, Metal or the they pod? share? No, no, no. So we went out to share tech, obviously, right? Oh, we not just shared tech. We shared effects and same, same assets. Oh, yeah, okay. the, 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 the missiles yeah. in Warhawk are exactly, exactly the same, the same. Yeah. As, yeah. as you see in Twisted right. Metal. I love because that. I liked them, and I said, "Well, I want those." <laughs> and, and, and Mike <laughs> okay, Young okay, was my that's... design was my design partner, and but he had we did a coin flip, and so Mike ended up getting Warhawk, and I ended up getting Twisted Metal. Yeah, right. And 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 so because we couldn't decide who's going to do what, and so Mike went off and did Warhawk, but they were you know all there's like. 14 man teams and there was a couple of people that were shared but they were all working on the same games and so so much was shared and when mike saw something he liked he's like i want that <laughs> and i saw something in warhawk i'm like well i fucking want that and uh it was it was great i mean it was a really hard job for those guys in utah i mean they 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 probably still mm-hmm. you know it was their version of god of war in terms of how hard they worked and how much it cost them. It was a real, because they made it in like eight, nine months. Yeah, it's, games. it's insane. It's insane. They made them for $850,000. Yeah. The games cost 49 bucks full price. I mean, the money that Sony made, which ultimately led Scott and the team to go, okay, everybody's getting rich, but us, mm. uh, we're going to go off and start incognito, which thankfully they ended up selling to Sony eventually and, and made, made some good money. But, I don't know, man. It was crazy. It was a lot of fun. Well, let me let me ask. Well, let me say two things first before I, before I forget to say these things. The the guys that made Battle Arena Toshin Den, Tamsoft, they're the guys that did I think some of the Senran Kagura games. They're still around, I believe. Mm. Um, and then the uh, the second thing is is that Jeff, you have got to get in touch with those video game museum guys to get that stuff backed up. You know, I was like about the, to say like you had like like even if even you know like you had, so you had all the old data of all the old Twisted Metal stuff. Like you got to yeah. get that stuff to them. I literally have stuff on the floor. Yeah, dude, you get me. like, in my opinion, I mean, as a histor- as a history guy and a historian, uh, you got to just wipe the jizz off of it. and hand Yeah, it wipe over, the man. jizz off, get the dust off of it, the fucking <laughs> the crumbs the jizz, and the jizz would be the good part. Yeah, they, they would they would want that. They'll put that in a vial. But yeah, I mean, there's yeah, I, you know I, I, I mean, like get in touch with those guys, because even if you end like even if it was like no one can see this stuff where you're like you it's whatever it, it should be backed up, don't you think? Like that stuff's so important in my yeah, opinion. I, I have to, I have so much stuff. I mean, there's a, a rig- that right behind me is original art from Lee Wilson from uh, Twist Metal 2. That's uh, awesome. Uh, yeah. Which was my absolute favorite piece of concept art he did. But he went on That's to do gorgeous. concept art for Halo and all this other stuff. But yeah, man, it it. uh I, I think looking back, the coolest part is just really you you didn't have enough experience to realize that your pie in the sky visions were pie in the sky visions. And so that, you know, delicious ignorance sustained you and led you to places you never would have gone if you actually knew what you knew, you know, if you knew what you knew today. Um, and so it was valuable and it was also just so delightful because you would be driving around going into work going, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and, you know, half of it. No, but it was still a wonderful way to, to live for, you know, a year and a half of just yep. looking into this future of 3d and going, we could do anything. Mm-hmm. So, well, tell me, tell me more about, let's talk a little bit more about single track. Cause I think my, um, my interaction primarily as a gamer with single track came with jet moto which was a game that I did love. Um, mm. my, I remember my friend Mike at, at Catholic School in New Hampshire introduced me to Jet Moto 2, and I was like, this is amazing. Uh, yeah. I really, really loved that game. Um, and it's not a very Colin game. For some reason, it was just one of those games that I really took to. But yeah, you were talking a little bit about their kind of experience as military, um, I guess, uh, defense contractors. And yeah, I, 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 well, they, well, they made, yeah, they made simulations for the military to train in. 
Mm-hmm. So I went out there. The first thing I did was I got into like, I think, I don't know, planes, F-15 or something. I got into a cockpit simulator that was surrounded by video screens. And I was flying around in the simulator that the military used because they were the ones that were designing those databases and simulation. So that, I don't, that, that was sort of what they did. And then a bunch of those guys, you know, there's a whole Pixar thing with those guys, right? So ENS gave birth to, uh, I think Ed Catmull was at ENS, who is now, you know, obviously a big wig at Pixar, I still think a lot of that 3d stuff was generated from Evans and Sutherland. And then uh, these guys broke off and did video games. So they, I'm, I'm almost certain it was ENS was the start of all that of both Pixar and some of the video game companies, because they were the only game in town. That's when we went to them because every, we thought it would give us an advantage. We were Sony ImageSoft which we mostly made crap. And so it was like, okay, well, we have to no, stay you, in business. You, you made that Hook game though, didn't you? Oh, Hook was great. Mickey Mania, okay. I thought was was really good. Sky Blazer was brilliant. Sky Equinox Blazer was amazing. Was yeah, but most of the games we made were terrible cliffhanger Game Boy and Last Action Hero and, you know, Dracula Sega CD and Sewer Shark. And Dude, just, I played those, man. Come on. <laughs> I'm glad someone did. I tested those. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, it uh, th- they were doing stuff for the military. Is yeah. It's so interesting because a lot of, I guess a lot of commercial implementation really does come from government exercises and NASA, yeah. the internet, obviously coming from DARPA, um, all the different stuff. It's so interesting. Yeah, these guys with dollar signs in their eyes already making a lot of money from from what they're doing for the government, no doubt. The dollar so wait a minute, all of the innovation is coming, you're saying, from the contractors that the military contracts. Yeah, what I was saying was that a lot. It seems and they like, yeah, use that money. Yeah. They get money. That's taxpayer money. Yes. So basically, innovation can work with socialism. It's not just a capitalist response. Interesting. Anyway, let's keep going. Colin. I would not. I mean, I'm not personally going <laughs> to. <laughs> I'm not personally going to go to the defense of the military I contractors, know. but if you'd I'm like to, that's totally yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's, but, let's. but I, um, I do love that you, it's like all the stupid shit that comes from NASA. Everyone knows all that stuff, but the, I love the idea of these guys at DARPA in the sixties, like connecting their phones to like these primitive mainframes to like send secret information to each other. Then they're like someone at some point was like, Oh, someone can send dick pics to each other over this and, then like <laughs> made, right. and made a ton of money. I love that. I think that's so interesting, but um, all right. So, Twisted Metal itself. T- talk to me a little bit about the the. I guess let's start with the embryo of it. Um, you're a designer already in the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mickey Mania would have been your last big game, right? Uh, well, it was my first and only game at the time, right? We because you done, were a tester bef- bef- before. I was a that. tester. We pitched it to Disney. That got us promoted to be associate producers, which right. was the only. Ju- there were no designers at Sony at the time, um, and so we were co-designers on that. Mike and myself with. Uh, 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 Oh God, the Traveler's Tales guys. I'm blanking on their names. Oh, I wouldn't. Um, know. Let me. I'll look it up. Right but here. yeah, uh, Andy and John. But I'm forgetting their last names. Anyway, w- one of them, uh, John, I think, does a, a big John YouTube Burton channel. and Andy Ingram. There you go, John Burton. And we fought like cats and dogs, and they hated us, and they should have because we had no fucking idea what we were doing. Uh, t- <laughs> you know, we had no fucking idea. And anyway, so that was out. And then we were doing some games with Malibu Comics, uh, which had like Prime and Strangers and just, you know, they, they were trying to be the next Marvel, and it all kind of shat the bed. And, you know, we ended up, I remember our boss pulled us into his office, Rich Robinson, and said, okay, guys, I love you guys. You guys are creative. You're badass. You want to do you want to change the world, but you're driving everybody crazy. And my feet are to the fire. This is your last chance. Go out to Utah and see if you can make something with these guys. And thank God it worked because we were, you know, we weren't the most popular kids on the playground at the time. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I forgot your question, Colin. I'm well, sorry. let me follow. Let me follow up on this because we were talking about the embryo of of Twisted Metal. So what yeah. was it? Was it brashness or like just you're young, you don't have the wisdom? necessary to kind of interact with the guys that had more experience at the time what what was the problem well the embryo of the idea of the no no, i'm saying in terms of following up uh, my quite original question was about the embryo but following up on what you just said you were talking about being kind of like a problem child and i'm wondering so i had gone out to california to go to usc and i went to usc and i went there to study film but i was an english major because my grades weren't good enough so stupid to get into the film school i'm like you want you, you you want me to study film 
and be a filmmaker and you give a fuck what I know about physics. Wait, I thought you went to film school. You never went to film school too? I went to USC and I made movies. I made more movies than a lot of the film students did. First year I was making a movie. I invited Spielberg to my set. Spielberg and Lucas walk onto my set because I took the keys because I worked at the cinema school and I just opened up a soundstage and said, fuck it. No one's here. Let's make a movie. You know, I mean, it's the same story ever. It's the same fucking story everywhere. It's like the universe is going to put walls up and the universe wants to see you break through them like juggernaut from Marvel comics. It's not about what the admissions board says, Oh, the admissions board says I can't be a filmmaker. I guess I'm not going to make films, but I wasn't very good at it anyway. So, which will lead back into twisted metal, but, um, yes, I know. so <laughs> but I, I had, I had, I had gone out there to make movies and I was testing and, when I got the chance to do creative work and not just testing work, um, I just took what I knew, which was very little from filmmaking and assumed, Oh, I'm a director of making movies. I'll apply that to video games. And so it wasn't that I was trying to be a dick. I was just like, I'm, I'm the voice. Everybody else are these hands that we've hired to do what's in my brain and make it real. And a, even on a movie set, it's a lot more collaborative than that. But certainly in video games, now it's a little different because everyone's so specialized. But at the time, it's like your programmer and your artist were the only ones used to making video games. They were the ones coming up with the ideas. They were the ones implementing the ideas. The idea of just some guy across the fucking ocean going, now I want this, see, and I want this, see. And A, a lot of the shit I wanted and Mike wanted was impractical and stupid. And B that's not how it works. And so it wasn't that I was a dick, although that was the response. It was, I came across that way. It was that I'm like, Oh, I thought this, there was no training. Like I said, there was not even jobs at Sony called designers. No one knew what we were doing. And I've said this on my show a number of times, which I I find the parallels between Microsoft right now and their internal management And the way Sony was at the beginning of the PS1 era up until, you know, Sony got lucky because we had to Shinden and we were able to get uh, Crash Bandicoot, you know, and we were able to, you know, thank God for Evans and Sutherland. But so many games came and went that were canceled because people up and down the food chain uh, hierarchy at Sony, none of us knew what we were doing. And so we just, you know, because the system was so successful because of third party and a couple of first party hits, we were able to sustain and live to fight long enough that we started to go, oh, this is how you make a game. And this is how to recognize bullshit when someone comes in and pitches you something stupid that might sound great, but you're like, well, wait a minute, what is the core game loop? What are you actually doing? Right. And so it's so weird to see Microsoft. I mean, again, I don't know if it's exactly, I'm not a fly on the wall there, but it's so, I see so many rookie mistakes that their management seems to make that I'm like, we made this mistake back in the nineties. Why don't you just go hire Alan Becker, or Shannon Studstill or Scott Rohde or Connie Booth and make them bajillionaires and tell them to come in and get your shit together. But anyway, the point being is that that was sort of why I was on my last legs because as much as I was creative and passionate and the bosses appreciated that and could recognize that there was a sense of, you know, nobody wants to work with you. I was like, here's a deep cut. I was like Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie at the beginning. It's like, you know, as talented as you are, nobody gives a fuck. You're a pain in everybody's ass. Fair enough. That's an awesome reference, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Gene, where's your mind? Uh, I haven't heard from you in a few minutes. I want to know where your mind is on, on where we should continue this conversation because I have so many things I want to ask. I want to make sure I'm not rolling you. Yeah, no, there's mind. just so many things. But I mean, I guess I can, you know, going back to the military conversation, I can see when you it's cool to, that you mentioned flying around that dome city and you see the dome city in the sky because I can see that DNA in, in Warhawk. Because Warhog, yes. Warhog had like fucking pyramids that you can fly to, and that was like yeah. mind blowing at the time. Warhog the, had Warhog, had, the ship, the airship, when, airships, and when, there were separate airships around the airship. Yeah, but you could go. The, the, you don't understand. You can go you inside do. the fucking you airship. You can go inside. I remember when Mike got the code sent to Santa Monica, oh. and he's like, "Oh my god, they did it!" Which was mm-hmm. you had this massive structure mm-hmm. that was flying, and you could fly around it and shoot guns. And then he's like, "Go in there," and mm-hmm. I'm like, "What?" Into the exhaust pipe or whatever. And he's like, "Yeah." And suddenly there was a whole interior, mm-hmm. and it wasn't a load. Mm-hmm. It was just there yeah. and it was like i don't know I, I i imagine every single human if you live long enough you will have that experience where technology 
sucker punches you. Yeah. And so I Those know somebody coming up right now would they, and I get it. I appreciate it. You won't see it. You'll it's never experience it. Right. But You'll you're going to have your own moment where you're like, maybe it'll be an AI thing or whatever. But for us, that was, I mean, remember you played super star Wars on the SNES mm -hmm. and then the if Death I want to get in the, if I want to get on the land speeder though, mm -hmm. it's like, well, let's load up mode seven boys. Yep. Now it's this kind of, you know, it's right. crazy. Yeah. So it yeah, was like the beginnings of you can live in these virtual <clears throat> worlds. It, it meant so much in terms, I don't mean like emotionally, although it did, but meaning that idea to seed out into the universe mm -hmm. of, Hey guys, games are no longer, side-scrolling wonderful experiences that are reflex tests with some story these are these are their own little universes now there's spaces and, that you can visit yeah, and you know? somewhere in your subconscious you're thinking like shit this is something this, and the, is, this is amazing the level of freedom that they offer was interesting too because this was back then when the ps1 where, where it would load the entire level at once yes and you can actually right. open the disc tray yeah. So I used to do this all the time for both Warhawk and Twist of Metal because both games allowed this. You can pop up in the disc tray, pop in your own CD, mm -hmm. pop it in, and then the, the PlayStation will play that CD music. to whatever music yeah. you want, and you can just play that level over and over again. And I fucking yeah. love that. So I used to it like pop in like cool. the Star Wars soundtracks or like fucking like you know death metal in in there. I just play Twist of Metal. It was it, it was just the best, you know, and, and so, me, so that, it, that's why it's great to hear that it wasn't streaming because it's just all off the disc, right? It just I don't think the first game I ever different. heard of streaming was Blasto that we mm -hmm. did at Sony. Dylan Job, no, not not Dylan Job, uh, Dylan who runs Pixel Q, Pixel Q, and oh, Japan Cuth now. Cuthbert, Dylan Cuthbert, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, I'll, my, I'm going to tangent. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm at the Hillsdale Mall. My wife and I coming down the escalator. <laughs> And Dylan Cuthbert's coming down and he's British and we're in, and me and my wife were talking about Monty Python and he overheard us and we knew Dylan and he's like, no, no, it's Python, Python. And we're yelling at each other on the escalators in the hills as we're separating. We're like, it's Monty Python, 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 this little fucking English voice <laughs> vanishing into the distance of the mall. He's been but on anyway, our show a couple of times too. He's, he's very, wonderful. Yeah, he's, he's great. Absolutely. He's wonderful. Uh, cool. um, so anyway, though, um, Gene, we weren't talking about anything. We were just—I was just—I was just gushing about like how amazing Warhawk was. So, yeah, and yeah, Twisted yeah, Metal yeah. too. Yeah. So I mean, like Twisted Metal streaming, also streaming, had, oh, yeah, streaming, yeah. streaming, streaming, right. which was his game. He coded it, mm. lead coder. That was the first time I ever saw streaming off a CD, and that was amazing to me that they were actually. They're like, we can make our levels as big as we want. We just mm -hmm. pull it off the disc. I'm like, holy shit, man! Sorry, um, go ahead. Let me ask you a little bit about the story and kind of the premise of Twisted Metal because I really dig this, and I don't think I ever really sat and thought about what it was actually about. Uh, until I played it, watched, you know, the, there's obviously the intro, read a little bit about it. You play through it, you see the endings. What Have are you the seen the actual endings? No, oh, oh the, you mean the the video, the, the video. live action ones? I watched yeah. some of them. I didn't watch all of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Because they're on, I found them on YouTube, but there's yeah. a, I think there's, I don't know if people have higher quality versions of them, but the ones I was watching all had this clicking noise on them. Did you guys? There's so many of them. Oh, okay, cool. So maybe I, I was just I, watching like a bad batch yeah. of them. Um but I wanted to ask you, because one of the things that I was disappointed with, with the new Twisted Metal, and I had said this on our spoiler cast for the first couple of uh, episodes of the show, the show, I mean, is um, it's post-apocalyptic or like it's after like the fall of mankind, mm, which the, I always the, thought the TV show, the TV show, TV right, show. right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so what I was going to ask you was that kind of bothered me about the show, because what I loved about the game, at least the way I understand it in my mind, having played the first one, was that this was all happening in like the normal mm -hmm. world, which mm -hmm. made it right. kind of insane. And that was disappointing when I saw that in the show, it's like they have to kind of justify the violence by making everything fucked up. But I thought what was really cool and what's shown about the game, what shined about the game was the entire idea of this happening and everyone's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, what yeah, the fuck is I mean, So it was that kind of the notion? Was that the intent of the game? Yeah, it was. It, well, I mean, Thomat story wise, yes, it took place 1999 Christmas Eve um, <clears throat> was the first Twisted Metal competition. And I wanted to set it at Christmas because I love Christmas decorations and games. Even back then, I just thought that was the coolest thing to be. You know, it, it gave it a sense of. Presence. So you like the Division Two or was it the, the Division One? One of those is in permanent uh, Christmas. Division One. Oh, I don't know. I haven't, oh, yeah. Later. One of the game. One of the games takes place on Black Friday. So everything's just permanently in Christmas. Oh, mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. That's why I mean, Miles Morales, one of my favorite superhero mm -hmm. games, just, not because it, it's great. And. 
it's fucking New York at Christmas in the snow. Come on. Sorry, I'm anyway, in Arkham, anyway. I mean, Arkham that's Origins. Totally, is you Christmas should too. do a total uh, Sacred Symbols Plus just on Christmas games. We could do that. Yep. Uh, Nights into Dreams. Come on, man. The Sega Christmas. Oh, my God. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, so the story was, yeah, we, I, I don't, we cut a video, Mike and I, uh, that was made up of a bunch and I wish I could find it. It was uh, done to an Aerosmith song. I forget. It wasn't a big popular one. And it was like, it started with demolition man of uh, the Stallone movie. And then it was just all of these great car chases and car explosions, just to kind of give a, a, a style guide. And what we realized and what we realized we loved about it was it was seeing, you know, this stuff in your own backyard. And this is before nine 11 and stuff. So it was, it was charmingly, dark and fun to blow up the Eiffel tower or to crash into storefronts. And, you know, we wanted to do the blues brothers thing, you know, through a mall, which is, I think a nod in the show at the first car combat is set in a mall, uh, of of the Peacock show. Mm. Um, you know, so it, it was absolutely part of the sauce of this is happening in your own backyard. We even went as so far in suburbia. There are these little quick marts, but they were supposed to be seven 11s. And this is how, this is how basic, it was back then. I wrote 7 Eleven. I said, Hey, we're doing this game. Can we put your shit in our game? They said, Sure. We put it in the game, and there were those stores were 7 Elevens, and we were hoping to get Slurpee cups with Sweet Tooth and all this shit. And it was just me writing letters, right? And then somewhere weeks before we went live, or not live, but shipped it, legal's like, uh, what's this? I'm like, oh, it's 7 Eleven. That's like such a standard of suburbia. <laughs> And they're like, no, no, no. Where did you, you know 7 Eleven? <laughs> yeah. I said, well, here's the letter. They said I could do it. And they're like, dude, no, this is not how this works at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And so that that got removed. I think we had Angeline, uh, the famous, you know, uh platinum bottle blonde who drove around the pink convertible in LA and had these billboards up. She just wanted to be famous. That's a real thing. There's actually movies about her now, but I reached out to her and I don't think she's in the current one because I think licensing and all that stuff legals like, <laughs> no. Uh, but at the time, you know, she was in it, you know, yeah, but I know I the wanted, billboards you're talking about. Cause I can yeah, see them. And yeah, I wanted touchstones of our real world because I thought it was more fun to destroy that. And so that, that was, and I'd never really thought about it with the Peacock show. I don't know what they're, maybe it, you're right. They couldn't, they didn't want to make it so like it was so fun. I have no idea, but that was absolutely a big part of the brand, uh, which was sort of fuck you to authority and, you know, fuck you to the, the normalcy. We're going to let these, you know, just, uh, divergent fuckers loose and let them kind of, take its task that was absolutely built in uh and i love that about it absolutely yeah that's interesting to hear because i think i think that what it, what happened was i watched the shows maybe the episodes first and then played the game <clears throat> i don't remember which but it was interesting in my mind ping-ponging back and forth between these two options that yeah. there's this much more justifiable in quotes a, a situation mm-hmm. where it's almost campy uh yeah. like post-apocalyptic stuff and then there's like the more like wow this is almost grand theft auto levels of satire. Mm-hmm in your in every i don't know if it was satire though that's where that's where the grand theft auto guys probably you know one of the key reasons they were always a lot more successful than i was i i was never i'm a smart guy but i'm not smart in that way and so to me this was very earnest to me hmm. like a lot of people um love now the in movies which are incredibly cheesy and i love that they love them and i love they have a life on youtube but I will never, I will never pretend that was intentional. I was serious. I was trying to make cool Twilight Zone creep show little movies and they were horrible because I have no skill in that category, in that, in that bucket. But a lot of people will tell you the best bad shit is when somebody doesn't know it's bad. Like you, when you try to make a bird dimmick or the room, it doesn't really work. And so it worked out okay. But that broke my heart because I was like, no, these movies are, it's not satire. This is this guy and he's Calypso and he gives wishes and oh no, that, you know. This, this is why we know Tommy was is smarter than you because Tommy was like, oh no, this is totally satire. It, it, no, no, totally he's not smarter you know? than me. He's, he's, he, he, <laughs> he's, he's a savvier, I guess. 
I think if you believe him, you're a moron. I believe uh, him totally. No, oh, come on, <laughs> come on. Um, but no, I was serious, man. I was absolutely serious. I was trying to make little creep show movies, and uh, that's so interesting. So it, yeah. it was not satire. That's. I just want to point that out. It, I wasn't. I'm not going to re- revisit history oh. and make it like it was a smart thing on my part. I just thought it was fucking cool. Well, what what happened that those didn't get included? I was reading online that it was like the through, the, I guess, some people internally had a problem with it or whatever. But I, so it was really interesting to me. So for the longest time, I was told because these, you know, Warhawk had movies which were awful, just so boring, so bad. But those got to be you should watch those fucking movies. I don't know if you remember. There's I like remember them. The bad guy named Creel Creel. And he's got this bald cap with these just like, you know, soda fountain tubes um, sticking out of his tubes face or whatever. And like, you know, Kool-Aid going through him like there's supposed to be blood. He's like, <laughs> ah, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you kill him by 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 flying into the mouth of the of the of his spaceship, but, which is so that's fucking right. sick, right? Yeah. I, yeah. It, it was awesome. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> so they got to keep theirs. And I remember the movies got edited for Twisted Metal and people started going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And so we did a focus group and the focus groups love them. They were like, they thought they were cheesy even back then, but they love them. And so I'm like, okay, we're good. And then word got to me that the people in Utah, some of the people are very religious, you know, Mormon folks out there. Um, were like, we're not doing this. These have tits and ass in them and they're devil worship and all this shit. I'm, I'm not going to finish the project if you put these in. And I hated wow. that, but I understood. Okay, the that's woke culture th- got you back in 1995. No, well, no, it didn't. No, no. Capitalist culture got me in 1995. Because here's what the it's real the same story thing: woke was. culture, capitalist culture. Well, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> ni- so about three years ago, Kelly Flock, who has since passed, wonderful guy, did 989 Sony Interactive Studios, was the executive there for Twisted Metal. I did an interview with him. You can find it on my channel. And he and I were talking and and I asked him point blank about it. He says, oh, no, no, that's not what happened. He says, I just thought they were terrible. And he said, um, a lot of people would come to Sony ImageSoft, which is what we still were at the time, because they wanted to kind of make a calling card to get into Sony Pictures and be in the movies. And I just thought this was another one of those oh, plays. Oh, interesting. And, and, he, and he's like, and then I realized, no you're serious. You really like these movies, you know? And, but so by that time it was too late, but I think what happened was my boss, Alan Becker, I don't know. I got to ask him probably told me he was probably, you know, smoothing it over internally. It's like, Oh no, no, don't blame Kelly. It's the guy, some of the guys out in Utah. And so that way, you know, so I, for 10 years was walking around thinking it was the guys out in Utah. And then finally Kelly's like, no, he's like, no, it was was me. It was the fact that I didn't want, you know, to lose money because people would make fun of them. Like motherfucker. But anyway, yeah. So that's, that's kind of what happened. That's That's so interesting. They would have brought so much value to the game, you know? Yeah. I I just, yeah, they, they would have. And, and I still think they do. I mean, I love, like I said, I love that they're out there um, as a little time capsule for fans of this, of the series. Um, And I love the fact that stuff in them made it into the TV show. Um, If you've watched the second episode, you know, if you play sweet tooth and win sweet tooth wants, you know, the idea is you, you enter this contest. Calypso is like a, demonic genie he'll give you whatever you want you just have to be careful how you ask for it blah 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 sweet tooth kind of throws him for a loop because he's crazy and he's like i want my friend harold who's a paper bag and that was in twisted metal one in 1994 there's a live version of it and there's a text version of it and literally that is now in the peacock show and when i saw that with will arnett and samoa joe literally giving the bag a drink in las vegas and i'm like this bag is in a shot and then it's actually a recurring character throughout the whole series i'm like are you shitting me they fucking put the bag in the goddamn show it's so funny you say that dude because i i we had so that's what happened we did the shows first and i had not played the game yet so then i that was what encouraged me to play the game that's what happened and then i realized that and we amended that on a more recent episode of sacred symbols where i was I, i didn't want to spoil it for anyone but i'm like the ending of sweet tooth's campaign or whatever is in the show, which I thought was kind of strange. So I, yeah. I was really, I felt less poserish now that I, cause I went and watched the third episode last night. Yeah. And um, which I think is really good. And I was like, Oh, yeah. I, I don't feel quite as like, like a poser now. Like I have like, can, more I, can I tangent very briefly Please do. about twisted mental? Please do. <clears throat> 
that show is fucking wackadoo for me because the stuff that winds up in the show, especially now that it's, I don't know what Peacock needs for it to be a hit, but it seems to be at least a fan hit. Um, you know, this will sustain for a while, right? The stuff in that show, everything from the bag, which was more thought out to there's this, uh, I think it's episode six or seven called nut house where quiet and John Doe take refuge in this, restaurant uh have you seen the series gene or not i haven't yet? seen the whole thing i've, I've only okay. watched up to episode two so but there are these lightning storms outside and they call them watkins storms uh and that's why they're seeking shelter and they're in and watkins harbor is a level in 2012 twisted metal but what's funny i just was like oh my fucking god because watkins is a name i flew out to utah in the afternoon but in the morning i at the time i took my daughter to preschool and we all sat around and did Little Red Caboose and all the little kid songs with the guitar lady. And in front of me was a super sexy mom that I always thought was super hot. And she had this super sexy tattoo on her butt and just beautiful fucking woman. And her last name was Watkins because she had that little, you know, the thong and her jeans were when she's sitting, yeah. you know, oh, applesauce lucky. crisscross. Okay. And, and then Watkins, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. And that's her last name. And so when I went to Utah that afternoon, they were like, we got to name this level. I'm like, oh, Watkins. It's Watkins Harbor. <laughs> and it was all because I thought she was fucking hot. And now it's in this fucking show that might live on for 50 years in terms of like reruns and repeats. That's Isn't beautiful. That the weirdest fucking thing. That is beautiful. That's, beautiful. that's, 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 that's the kind of honestly beautiful. I'm actually tearing up. You, could, yeah. you, yeah. you couldn't write that. I think, yeah. fellas, I think I have a chance now. Yeah. Uh, with, with good old Miss Watkins. Yeah, you got to go look up Miss Watkins, Watkins and see yeah. what's going on. Um, that's you know, so you, fascinating. You never forget like, the hot I mom, did though. that for you. I yeah. did that for you. You never forget that. You you not, you never forgot her. That's incredible. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, I did forget her until, until she you, was in the show. Right. And I'm like, oh my god, she was hot. This is like yeah. a Bruce Springsteen song or something. It's crazy. <laughs> it's exactly <laughs> like that. I need my. I listen. Let's Colin. Let let the big boys talk. Listen, Gene. Um, I need a write up in Washington Post comparing me to the new Springsteen. That's what I need at this point. You've basically. Will you do it, Gene? Yeah, this is the new Thunder Road, man. Seriously. Oh, you know, my God. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> I'm going to meet Taylor Swift because of this. This is going to be great. <laughs> anyway. Um, what about like, yeah, well, so let me back up. I'm, I'm so fascinated about you talking about being in the 3D space and kind of like mm -hmm. being floored by this. Now, there's got to be another level to that, which is, well, what do you do in it? Right. Like, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm curious how it was designing really one Hard. of the first games of, of its kind. It's mm -hmm. I, it was well, so hard. Well, let me let me say this is like. It's see uh, what I loved about the game. What I was really hard at first for me to understand it, like playing it. I was like, this is fucking like, what am I? Well, the controls to are terrible, yeah, mm -hmm. but like there's a there is a like Gene said earlier, once you kind of get it, there's a logic to it. And before you know it, even you just you adapt to what's broken about it or you adapt to whatever yeah. and you mm -hmm. learn how to play it. And I think it's surprisingly it's chaotic. It's crazy, but yeah. it's also so elegant and funny how well you can actually play it within the confines of this very limited control scheme mm -hmm. and i so I, I by the end of it i was just grinding trophies at the end and i'm playing on the rooftop and it's just like damn dude i'm actually getting pretty goddamn good at this game just after yeah. a few days so talk to me about like designing this game because I, I think that this is a, this is probably the most amazing part the, well this is you know why i always consider myself a better you know, I'm a, I'm an okay designer. I'm a better kind of creator, director, IP generator. Um, because I, you know, Nintendo would never do this. Nintendo would never start with the concept. They would start with the, mm. uh, uh, abstraction mm -hmm. and go, what do we want the player to be doing? And then everything builds on that. And that's the way you do it. If you want to make a great game. For me, it was being stuck in 405 traffic with Alan and Guillaume coming back from single track and going, let's make a Mad Max game. You know, it was, it was, it was pure concept first. And we got the, you know, I remember sitting, we had a giant round table at Sony Image Soft that we, we worked out of the Sony Music Building and the round table was designed to look like a CD, right? So all of us would sit around that table and it was the day marketing came in and we would pitch them the stuff we wanted green lights for to make for our first PlayStation one titles. And, you know, people were pitching and pitching and pitching and they got to me and I just said, I want to make this game at the time. It was called battle cars. I want to make battle cars. And it's just cars with guns in a city. And I remember Peter Dilly, the head of marketing just looked at me and said, okay, yeah, that's done. 
right? That that's that's how easy it was to get a green light for this. Um, and so once all the chips had fallen, and I'm sitting in our design room going, okay, well, single track, and they will would admit they said back then they're like, we know nothing about gameplay, so they were really looking to us at the beginning. They eventually, you know, became great. Um, because they didn't know. And so I'm sitting there, I had a copy of Steve Jackson's car wars, which was like a Mad Max RPG tabletop RPG. And I'm reading all this stuff about cars and I'm like, yeah, what the fuck do you do in this game? You know? And there was a time, one of the, Michael Jackson, he had uh, sent us a, he was reading snow crash from uh, Neil Stevenson and said, Hey, let's do a pizza delivery thing. And I was like, eh, no, that's not right. And uh, you know, eventually we, I, like I said, we finally just looked at, we were playing a lot of Mario Kart uh, battle mode and a lot of Mortal Kombat. And, and at that point we said, every time we try to throw something on this, like a mission or this or that or the other, it, it let's just make it about the battle. And I think we thought we were going to make, be able to make it deeper than it was, but I think twist metal two is probably the best in that way mm-hmm. because the battles are more interesting, but it eventually just became it's deathmatch slash mortal combat. And, and, but it, it, and I know that sounds easy. It's one of those things that when you realize uh, what it is, you're like, well, yeah, that would have taken five seconds to think of. But at the time, like you said, when you're designing for 3d at the time, th- some of the things we didn't know were like, I remember there was a game called Disney stunt Island and it was before we actually had PlayStation dev kits. I was going in there and just walking around going, okay, how do I keep the player from going wherever he wants? Like, this was a problem. We didn't, how do you solve that? Um, you know, now it's easy, you know, we'll lock a door, kill so many enemies, this, that, the other. But at the time, these were problems that had to be solved, right? Um, and so it seems simple, but it took us a long while to arrive at this is sort of the core loop. And then from there, we started diving deep into the individual cars and going, okay, let's make, you know, let's make this one when it fires its weapon, make this sound. So, you know, you know, uh, Crimson Fury's coming around the corner or let's make sure that the front, and this is, this was so much fun for me when Steve Paulson, the AI creator of all the twist metal games sat with me and explained to me, he's like, look, I'm going to give you these uh, spreadsheets and every car, here are the parameters, how it can drive. And here are the parameters of sort of physically how it moves. Like if you watch Sweet Tooth, whenever he turns, he almost tumps over, um, like his wheels come off the ground. Um, hmm. And then here are the parameters of sort of how they how they chase and when they decide to flee. And I was like, oh my God, I can just with numbers build personalities into these vehicles, right? So suddenly I made sure Dark Side, who's the big semi truck, it's like, yes, of course he has a lot of hit points um, and he never runs, right? And so you start to recognize even at a almost conscious level, I have to approach this vehicle a little different than I have to approach that vehicle. And I was so jazzed by that, that just these numbers could really, within reason, allow these bricks that are moving around the level to sort of have a personality and affect the way you approach them as a gamer. So it really was, it was never a thing of like day one twisted metal. Here's your green light because you've told us what the core loop is. That's what anybody would demand now as they should, if you're green lighting a game at the time, it was the idea is cool. Here's your green light. What the fuck is it? We don't know. Okay. Let's just make it a fighting game. And then all the way up until weeks before it went to manufacturing we were trying to you know squeeze the sponge to get as much sort of fighting game depth out of it and then uh at alpha one of the programmers comes in over the weekend and says i wanted to put in split screen it was never Mm. a thing it was never on the radar um and he puts in split screen and all of those design elements worked in multiplayer as well which was total luck and obviously we had to tune it um and that really became the mainstay of that whole series is the multiplayer so shit happens man i don't know i don't know it's it's crazy also uh i tried i reached out to aerosmith to get steven tyler to play calypso but i never heard back whatever (laughs) 
<laughs> fucking who's laughing now old man <laughs> probably him but whatever do the you, way you describe the ai reminds me of pac-man too uh, because each of the ghosts yeah. have different different behaviors too so in that's miss crazy. pac-man miss pac-man, miss pac-man, pac-man yeah, that's one right. it's right. it's a it's just a pattern that's right that's right but yeah the, the way you're able to program different personalities in the way again like you said these these bricks of polygons are just moving yes. so you know that specter is going to be fast and you know he's made out of tissue paper. So and, you, yeah, you know, just, and so all it, of the things come dark side, together. Like you just fucking run them over, you know. Well, if you're in dark side, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and all of it comes together, right? So Spectre has these missiles that go through walls, mm-hmm. and this was not intentional. Scott, it's so oh. much stuff you learn. That's just, I, I, I am still so passionate about game design. I don't want to do it anymore, but it's one of those things that it, it just all these elements like Spectre's missiles are cool but it wasn't until the sound guys put this kind of this kind of a uh, roman candle sound to them mm. because those missiles can launch because his missiles go through walls from anywhere in the map which means the minute you hear that sound your gameplay becomes shit be on the lookout look on your radar i don't remember if we had the thing on the radar or not at the time that may have been too but even a sound effect can change what the player is thinking about and doing and i mm. just what an amazing little college education of game design that game was because I never thought of that. I never thought how all this stuff worked. So like I said, we, we, Sony was a baby at this shit. All of us, not just twisted metal, but all the games, no one knew what we were doing. It was amazing. Do you, amazing um, we got what we were. do you consider the game? Um, Cause I know a lot of fighting game designers obviously pride themselves on balance and a lot of games become unbalanced after the fact, cause they didn't know. Um, yeah. And obviously, you couldn't do anything about it during the time of you know this patchless era. Um, do you right, feel like the right. game is relatively balanced, or did you discover things after the game came out? Because I, I imagine testing testing at this time is very limited. You're not going to learn everything yeah. about it. They still yeah. don't learn everything about games today. Testing them, so um, I, you know, I, I don't have you know. I, I would say Twisted Metal Two was more tested and more balanced because we knew from the beginning what it would be. Um, <clears throat> I, I I would imagine we put every car against every car and we were able to win but when it's testers against testers you know it, it, sure dark you know mr grim can beat dark side but you know i remember your testers lighting me the fuck up when i went and played 2012 um oh, it, yeah. it was specifically to a session i don't know you probably wouldn't remember you do the million i remember it oh do yeah, yeah and it was like I, I embedded with the qa team yeah. on 2012 for like two months and all we did was tune and balance it's all we fucking did. right so i came and visited um, you during that and played it with yeah. you guys and just got wrecked and i think i don't, I don't remember 20 i didn't review it or anything obviously but mm-hmm. was there a, a stage in 2012 that was the rooftop from the original game every game has had a rooftop oh, okay s- mm-hmm. that we've done okay cool so but it's never been as good as the first one we've never been able to figure out why the rooftops in one we're better than any other rooftops we ever did. Interesting. Rooftops okay. one still fucking work. I'm learning as we go here. It's so interesting because <laughs> yeah. in my mind, I, I made, I connected these memories probably, well, falsely, it seems like where I'm like, oh, I, I kind of remember being on a rooftop and just getting oh, yeah. lit up. Just mm-hmm. absolutely. But it was so fun and how good everyone was at the game. And I imagine it wasn't quite that dynamic in testing in, in 1995. Um, uh, it was, well, it wasn't that, uh, we didn't have that many people, but we had some great fucking players that knew all the tricks and secrets. And um, do you remember anything you learned, like testing it that you were able to fix? Anything fun or interesting? Not, the, the original, yeah, one? the original, the original uh, 1995 um, one. I mean, it was probably just stuff like, you know, Mister Grimm is cool, but he's super weak, and and so the the answer was, of course, let's give him the most powerful special in the game. So if you can figure out how to race right at somebody and get out of there before they crush you in one or two hits, you're going to be a force to be reckoned with. So that was probably something that came out uh, through testing. Um, We tried to make the, the, the weirdest part is we tried to make every character balanced so that anyone you picked was enjoyable. But end of the day, like when you're saying you pick Sweet Tooth and you pick Dark Side, I would never play those cars because they're too slow and the turning radius is it's like I, I always just pick middle of the road roadkill. Um, and that's that's just sort of the base car uh, because it feels like it, it, it's more. I, I like speed more, but I need armor. He's the so I'm always car. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always average, average car. But uh, that's the kind of stuff we learn probably. And then, you know, just. uh 
probably, you know, I don't know. And that was, that's probably the gist of it. I was attracted to dark side by the way, because, um, and I think I called him outlaw before, which I misspoke. I was attracted to dark side before because, or, or in the game, because he has all that armor where I'm like, well, I'm not good. So I, this will uh, give me my, the best chance I have to probably survive. And sweet tooth. I just felt like was the iconic. He was like the Ryu. He came up first for me, you know? Yeah. So it was he like, was not designed to be that. I mean, he was, you know, that's the funniest part is that, you know, even in twist metal two, he's a secret character. It was never, we never knew he was going to be the, uh, the mascot. That's interesting. Did you put him on the fucking cover, though. He's on the cover. Well, of the yeah, but who else are we going to put on the fucking cover? <laughs> Calypso. Have you seen the guy? Yeah. Um, he's you know, I mean, terrifying. I hate him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, marketing. Marketing was like, well, faces sell more, and you have a face. Let's put that on the cover. I mean, I love the oh, cover. I'm not okay. kidding. That's but interesting. But it wasn't like we knew he was going. And I, I remember when I knew it worked, even though it wasn't, you know, the intention. Is I was going to the dentist in LA, and the lady, the dental hygienist, she's like, "Well, what do you do?" I'm like, oh, "I work in video games." Oh, my boyfriend loves games. It wasn't the time where everybody played games. It was like her boyfriend, and uh, she says, "What do you work on?" I said, "I do this thing called Twist Metal," and she's like, "Oh, that's the one with the clown." Mm. So I was like, "All right, nice." Mark, it did Mark work. Knows what it did doing. work. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll shut the fuck up. Gene, who was your uh, uh, who was your character in, or your car? Well, it was Roadkill. Roadkill uh, or Roll or uh, Agent Stone. Uh, cause this was back then where I didn't like really think critically about cops. And I was like, fuck yeah, I'm a, I'm the police, you know, he and I want to be, like, co- he I wasn't a, be cop. a cop like a, a, in the night city, you know, and, and oh, that's the, in the outlaw. suburbs. Uh, that's outlaw, yeah. So. yeah. Uh, 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 agent stone is, uh, drove. It's so weird to see these characters in the show, but mm-hmm. agent stone was the spy, uh, who oh, was that's supposed right. to be that's kind right. of like, um, Crimson Fury, uh, right. Crimson Fury. He was supposed to be kind of like James Bond. And yeah. even when he fires his laser, it was the it was the closest we could get to dun, 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 that legal would let us. So I think now he fires his laser and it's like, dun, dun, dun. but it's like that's the sound that. it makes when he fires it. And I think he was going after a flight control box that a plane had been shot out of the sky, a passenger plane, and it allowed proof that aliens were real. And then the guy driving Warthog was going after the same box because he wanted it for the military so no one would ever know. So, I mean, it was just, it was so weird. It's so fucking weird. But anyway, point being is Outlaw, the cop, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm at E3, the first E3, and people are playing and you can play Outlaw and people are chasing somebody around playing Outlaw or the AI. I don't remember. We had the combat cable set up at the time. Uh, and they were destroying outlaw and these two security cops walked by and they just looked at it. And we're like, God, like shaking their head. Like, this is terrible mm-hmm. that you're able to kill cops. <clears throat> I'm like, dude, dude. And they just walked away. I'll never forget it. I mean, that's why when I played grand theft auto, my first thought was, Oh, this is the twist of metal that I always wanted twist of metal to be. You know? Right, right, right. Um, because again, those levels were really big and I would spend a lot of time in them. Like, you know, I, I know you were worried about like players having objectives and being busy, but I just enjoyed driving around. The, 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 yeah, this, but there the was city, a lot you know? more under the hood. Uh, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. But there was a lot more in GTA, even if you just drive of around, course. that we, we weren't able to do interactivity and and things. I will tell you, I lost my shit. Every game, I don't do it anymore, although I don't make games anymore. But every game I've worked on, there's been another game I've heard about in production that's like, oh, fuck, they beat us to it, right? Mm-hmm. This is the mm-hmm. problem with designing games based on concepts and not abstract mechanics because mm. ideas are easier for other people to have at the same time. Mm. And the Atari Jaguar announced this game while we were in production called club drive. And it was the first time I had seen a 3d drive around game. And that was our big hook. I was like, no, they, we want to get to it first. How mm-hmm. dare they? And it ended up a, it's on the Jaguar. So who cares? And B, <laughs> it also ended up just being a terrible game. But I remember like every fucking week I'd look, the magazines and just be like please don't let anybody get to us before and i had people come up to me developers at e3 saying god we've been wanting to make this game forever so it we just happened to get there before everybody else did i i'm under no illusions that no one ever thought about let's make a 3d car combat game I, mm-hmm. i'm sure there were many so well i mean you know I'm, I'm thinking back to what colin said earlier you know colin said that he was in the, into final fantasy and mario and i remember mm-hmm. twisted metal warhawk and those early PlayStation games wipe out, you know, the the, the mm-hmm. early Psygnosis games being like, oh, this is the Western side of, of video video games. This is like, the, you know, this is like PC gaming, but like on, on my console, that's incredible. So that's kind of why these games were so memorable, memorable for me because they, their aesthetic, their attitude was completely different. Mm-hmm. It was the first time 
it was the first time in my in my young life where I was like, oh, this is this this is adult video games, not what Sega Genesis yeah. was talking about, or not even what Mortal Kombat was, but this is Western adult gaming here. You know, I don't know if it's a a combination of Sony giving us a great deal of freedom, uh, and the technology at the time getting to a point where there was enough memory and space to do more than the bare minimum of what the game required. But, you know, even with God of War, I look at Twisted Metal like as the game that most represents me. Like, I love God of War. God of War is me as well, especially the first one. I'm all over that game. But Twisted Metal, you know, I've always said feels like just like a a, a grungy American bar band where you go and there's sawdust mm-hmm. on the floor and there's, you know, the smell of, you know, spilled beer everywhere but the people on stage are just really good and and if you can get past the rough around the edges elements there's a lot of heart and a lot of soul i i think so much about that when i think about twisted metal and and it really does feel uh like if somebody were to say jaffe you've worked on a number of games and you've obviously collaborated with a lot of people so everyone's got their dna there but which one most represents you i i would say the twisted metal series is probably the closest to my own sort of uh essence it's my spirit video game is what i would say mm. i love it what was it like uh finally getting out there and seeing people's response to it although i guess you said you were at e3 so you you had started getting well it, it, no we i'll tell you what yep. you, gene mentions e3 uh, uh, warhawk yep. so the first time i started recognizing i think we were fucked i mean you don't know man we we sat in a marketing meeting and they were showing all the games coming for launch and I remember going to the bathroom and I heard two of the marketing guys and they're going, Oh man, that Warhawk, all people were talking about was Warhawk and Twisted Metal was never a mention. And then we did these focus tests with core gamers and they loved Warhawk and they absolutely hated Twisted Metal. They shit all over it. Mm. And I remember, um, I called my wife at the time and I'm like, I got to find a new job. I'm terrible at this. No one likes this game. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, it was, it, 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 we launched it and I still loved it, but I was just like, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be Warhawk is the big title, but apparently, you know, it was on demo disc at kiosk and the multiplayer really helped sell it. And suddenly somebody said, Hey, Jaffe, you guys got game of the year from EGM. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yoshi's Island is game of the year. That's the best. <laughs> I mean, that was the best. Fucking well, I mean, game yeah, in 95. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're like, no, go look. And I went to the newsstand and I'm like, fuck, they, you know, and it just from there, people just started talking about it and stuff. And, um, but even when Kelly greenlit the sequel, we were like, okay, well, we've got to change a lot of stuff, you know, because the controls are really hard for people to get their heads around. So I have concept art at first. We said, let's make them hover cars. And so they were, uh, twist metal two was going to have like, uh, these really cool, cars but they were on hover pads so you could strafe and and all that and then there was a small amount of time we were considering making them insects like let's make them crawl up walls and you can strafe and stuff because we were worried that the controls were just too non-intuitive for people to do what we wanted them to do and lo and behold it it we didn't have to do that thank god uh but we thought it was going to be a disaster before it came out absolutely well i hope we can you know, not imminently. I don't want to take everyone's time up and force them to play a game right now. But uh, Twisted Metal 2, I definitely want to play. And I would love to talk about that game separately because I mean, it's fun for me to learn as we go. And then I'd like to play Twisted Metal Black, which was a game that I played a little bit in college, but didn't own. And then um, Twisted Metal 2012, which I just really had the only experience I really had playing. It was in preview events. So, yeah, I would love I, to I, go. I think yeah, there's no I mean, there's good stuff about all of them. I, I would Twisted Metal 2. I was very pleased with. I mean, I thought Sony did a great job with both of the ports or whatever they did to them, but they, my only experience playing Twisted Metal 1 had been um, emulation since well over a decade. And it, you know, it doesn't play very well on emulation, at least in a browser and all that. So that was sort of my memory of it. And then when I played it the other day, I was like, oh my God, it, it, still play it's antiquated as fuck but it's plays a lot better than it has any right to and certainly twist metal 2 i was like holy shit this is still fun i mean again it's old i don't want to sell people listening like it's a great foot you know it holds up as good as miss pac-man no uh but 
it works though. It still works. It still I'm, works. I was stunned by that. And pleased as punch. I, Gene, I think you spoke to something really important too. Although as a kid, I just didn't understand it, what it was, mm-hmm. which was, cause I, you know, all this was happening. I, my dad had doom on his PC or like his PC, I should say his PC had doom. He didn't give mm-hmm. a shit about doom. Um, but I played that there. And, and like you said, these early 3d games, my brother getting his PlayStation playing PS one at my friend's houses. I didn't get my own until I sold most of my SNES game collection to buy a PS one for as everyone, everyone did at that time, final fantasy seven. And so that's when I got in myself. So, Mm. but there was something, my fifth, sixth, seventh grade mind couldn't quite understand, but it was, it was Western games. Like for the first time Mm. you were really playing, or at least I was being exposed to Western games because I grew up on the NES, the SNES. Mm. My friends had Genesis and Master System and all this stuff. No, there was no very few Western games unless you were buying licensed trash like later in the SNES era or whatever. So you're totally right. The games had a totally different flavor and I was very, I don't want to say put off by it. I didn't know what to do with it. I, it didn't feel like it was for me. It felt like it was for older people, right? And so a little weird. I, I was like at this inflection point, I think at that time where I was like, I'm just going to stick with, I was playing like Beyond the Beyond and Wild Arms and oh yeah, Beyond the Beyond. You know, all that kind of, <laughs> Beyond the Beyond was awful. You know, yeah. Project <laughs> Horned Owl, you know. And then on the other side, there was all these three, especially 3D games. And I would mix in every once in a while. Like I said, I, I Jet Moto. Medal of Honor was a huge seminal game for me. Yeah, of um, course. Great game. Where, the second one was even better. Where, oh, Medal Underground. of Honor opened my mind for the first time to be like, no, you like this. Like, mm-hmm. it's this is not an anomaly. You like this. Like mm-hmm. shoot, the first person is perspective and shooting. And I opened my mind to it for the first time. And then Red Faction was a really big game. An unreal, um, you know, uh, was it Unreal Tournament Two or whatever that that was on um, okay, early on PlayStation PS- yeah, on yeah. PlayStation Two. So those games in two thousand one, two thousand two, and then I really started to embrace shooters, which was not a thing that I cared about at all. So you're totally right, Gene, about that. Mm-hmm. I don't, but as a kid, I didn't, I just didn't know how to process that. I didn't yeah, because back then, like that, the Western games were either PC, like you're fucking playing mm-hmm. Mist or Doom, right? Or, you, or it's the fucking Atari Jaguar, like like Jaffe said, right? Or or the 3 do and and like no, nobody fucking owned an Atari Jaguar or Panasonic 3 do um, I didn't know anyone that owned a Jaguar. I knew one guy that owned a 3 do and it was my sister's roommate in college, mm-hmm. which was which was strange. And <laughs> where are they now? Yeah, where are they now? It's it's uh it's so Away the Warrior. It was obviously the, a notable oh, game yeah. on there that Naughty Dog made. Sure. Um. Mm-hmm. But right, maybe, yeah. it's, maybe it's generational in the sense that because I came up with Western games, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm an Atari kid. So all of my Atari 2600 and in television was made in California. So I don't know how much of that played a part, but it never, I never associated video games with Japan. I always associate video games with Atari. Well, kind so of me Dodge too, because so I grew up with Atari and uh, the first video game I ever played, and I'm actually hoping to do a story on it pretty soon, is Karataka by Jordan Mechner. Oh, you know, so course. like, yeah, the first, my first contact with a video game was made by a white dude, you know? So that was, yeah. it was of course, Mario dominated that and I started, and Final Fantasy and everything. And I started, I stopped thinking about it that way, but that's why when PlayStation came back, I was like, oh, this is, it's, it's awesome to see creative minds from california or the u.s or even europe or whatever you yeah. know uh uh making these games it was interesting i will say super mario brothers the arcade game mm. was the first game i ever downloaded illegally on a modem and it blew my mind somebody's like yeah dial this number and put in this fucking code mm. and three hours later i'm playing mario and this was like 1982 or something 83 and i'm like Oh my God, I just got a free game and I didn't even have to leave my house. It was the beginning of that shareware era where th- there was a yeah. lot of trust. Well, it wasn't, trust me, it wasn't shareware. Yeah. It, yeah, <laughs> it well, was I, cracked. Yeah, and it, it was, all that stuff. It's just fun. Like, that was I the thought I was the kid in war games. I was like yeah. worried that the government was going to come. The only, what is it? The only choices or the only mo- winning move is to not play yeah. or whatever. It's also it's interesting that you brought up uh, uh, the metaverse too and, and uh, um, that book um, because John Romero. Oh, Snow Crash. Oh, yeah, Snow Crash, because John Romero, Romero also mentions it because John Carmack was going around telling people, hey, we can build, because when he built Doom, he was like, hey, we can build a metaverse with this shit. So like oh, metaverse wow. talk was like going on way back in like 90s, yeah, like, like around your era. That's amazing. Yeah, Jeff, he's yeah. one of those guys. He's very modest, but it's like he's one of those guys, too. It's just people that see things mm-hmm. where they're going well ahead of everyone else. That's just that's vision, you know? Um, yeah. It's well, really, that's why like yeah. your vision about having 7-Eleven and like real IP in a 3D universe. That's the metaverse. That's exactly what the metaverse concept yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, know? I just wanted cups though. Well, man. yeah, you just I, wanted to sleep. I just cups wanted collector's <laughs> cups. But that, that, and you know that what? I was so right? pissed. The one thing, because I, you know, I grew up 
loving all that stuff, having Boba Fett on the Burger King glasses. And, Darth Maul and, on the it, fucking Taco Bell. It was like you're in the zeitgeist. And I thought that would be so cool to, to do that, totally. to create something that did that. And I never got it. And then I remember I was at my kids. Uh, they were in grammar school at the time and God of War three had come out, which I didn't work on at all for the most part. Um, and they did Slurpee cups. And there was a fucking kid who must have been third grade. So why is he, you know, what does he know about Kratos? Hopefully nothing. Uh, but he's walking around with a Slurpee cup and it took all of my desire not to slap that fucking thing out of his fucking hand. I was so mad. So the minute I leave Sony, they just hey, dance, do some Slurpee cups with Jeffy stuff. <laughs> fucking yeah, it's very specific. That sucks. Yes. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's what that kind of ties back to what I was saying earlier about credit and all that kind of stuff. But like, whatever. Um, I'm really fascinated by this this conversation. I think this is uh, this is awesome, uh, and it, it's it's insightful. There was something very nostalgic about playing this game for me, not mm-hmm. in remembering it, but in being in inside of the game. There, like you said, that being existing in a 3D space and exploring it, especially in Cyberbia, I felt like was mm-hmm. very. There was something very, I don't know, weird about it for me, where I was like, I like this is very comfortable. I see this in a nine through a nineties lens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's something yeah. really special about it. I loved it. Um, you should have, you run people over in Siberia. That, that uh, again, yeah. that was like Grand Theft Auto. I was like, Holy shit. You know, the, 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 the depravity yeah. of this game. It's awesome. You know, Peter wrote us a letter though, and said, we want you to take your game off the market because you can run over dogs. And I said, no, you can't. Uh, you can run through a dog. Mm. But there, we intentionally made it so you could not kill the dog. But they were just, you know, so we finally wrote back and said, I'll tell you what, you want to go to court? Let's go to court. And you show us where you can hit a dog. Because unless you've broken into, you know, single track and added some code, I don't know how that's possible. But sure, we'll go to court, you know. And then legal's like, you can't write back to them directly, <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. You must have. But you should have, Colin, yeah. I'm serious. He won't come on my show, I think, because he knows I know where the bodies are buried and he buried half of them. But ultimately though, you should have Alan Becker on. I think he would, tr- and it's not that he doesn't trust me, but I think it would be more of a proper interview. He's retired now, but you know, I don't know if you ever met Alan. Yeah, we, I met him a couple of times. I don't know if he would remember yeah. me, but yeah, I met him. If, if you look at, he just, I don't really do LinkedIn, but let me just tell you something really quickly. You can edit this out. I, really? Can I, Jeffy? Thanks for allowing me to edit shit. I'm just saying, uh, I'm going to go to LinkedIn Cause I just saw, I don't go to LinkedIn that often, but I saw this and he's retired now. And the thing he put at the top of his page um, was just sort of like, Hey, I'm retired. Here's what I did. And I was just like, when I looked at it, I was like, Oh my God, uh, this is insane. So let me just tell you his, uh, his profile post. He says, um, Top Metacritic scores. Here are the games that he had direct influence on uh, as the executive who ran all this shit. I'll start at the bottom. Astrobot Rescue Mission, God of War Chains of Olympus, Shadow of the Colossus Remake, Flower, Twisted Metal Black, Demon Soul Remake, Bloodborne, Journey, God of War 3, 2, and 1. Right? I mean, when you talk about the early days of Sony mm-hmm. or people who laid the foundation, this guy was there up until you know, PSV. Yeah. He was SVP for a long time. Right. Of yeah. 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 And, and he got, he got, in my opinion, he got fucked. I mean, he, he, he deserved more than he got. Um, but that said though, I think if you enjoyed this conversation, he would be a wonderful guy to talk to about all of that. He was there when crash came through the door for the first time when it was called Willie the wombat. Uh, I'd love for, I'd love for that. You want to make, if you want to make that introduction, I would, I I will because I, 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 I'll be mad at him and say, you're a son of a bitch for not coming on my show, but I get why he won't. Um, but I think you guys would have a, a great conversation. I think the audience would really dig it too. I mean, the motherfucker was there for Bloodborne. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, right? I mean it's, it's come awesome. On. Yeah, so that would be fun. I, I would appreciate that. And I, um, I hope we can continue this conversation about Twisted Metal as well. I'm really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I Anytime. feel, I feel like I'm fairly encyclopedic about PlayStation and their early, the PS1 era, like you said, during that nebulous second party kind of stuff like where sony didn't really know what it was doing and it was kind of acquiring things and being very smart and or being very lucky rather and not very smart and all that it's more mysterious to me because i didn't really come into like the consciousness of what i would consider like the plugged in tuned in gamer until somewhere in the ps1 era so i found Mm -hmm. myself kind of amongst that right as opposed to being 
six, seven, eight years old playing NES, SNES, or whatever, and just really enjoying games, suddenly I started to understand them. And uh, so filling in these holes, like Twisted Metal is a, yeah. a substantial gap, probably maybe the most substantial, actually. So I really look forward to playing the second one and hopefully talking about that in the future. And when we talk about it, ask me how Twisted Metal ties into Phil Spencer blocking me on Twitter. I will, he did, he, did, he, did he block you on Twitter? I think we... He, he unblocked me since. Oh, okay. But... He, but I, I'll, should I tell you now? I'll tell you later. You tell me whatever. I do what it would. I'll tell you now. Okay. I don't make your show too long, but, um, but I have given you permission to edit it. So everything's fine. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I mean, you're talking to the guy with the, do you guy really want the, me to edit the, edit the stuff out? No, oh, okay. no, no. I just, I'm just, 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 just want to be I'm sure that I'm respecting You know me. Yeah. I ramble. So, um, sorry, I'm tangenting. Well, the Spencer. most heartbreaking sometimes is to have these go up on YouTube and look at the comments and, most people are really kind towards me, but sometimes it's like, oh my God, Jaffe, shut the fuck up. I'm like, and I'm behind the screen. Just trust me, commenter. I know. I know. But listen, <laughs> um, <laughs> here's the point. Uh, so I had a Halloween special on the Gabin and Games, which is a show I do. And uh, I got the actor who played Calypso in Twisted Metal 2 to come in and I wanted to do an intro. And you, this is on YouTube now. And, and it was... Um, I was like, oh, it's a long lost Twisted Metal 2 ending that no one ever saw. And I did all the little stupid, you know, very amateur animations and stuff. And he did the voice of Calypso and it looked like a TM2 ending. And it was a story where Phil Spencer had won Twisted Metal. And his prize was, um, he, what did he want? He wanted um, to win the console war, right? And so it became a console war, but it became as Calypso twist your words, it became a literal war. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, and so it starts with like, it, 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 you know, there's countries attacking countries and nukes going off. Over and all PlayStation and, Xbox. And, and, <laughs> and like Xbox Liberation Day, I took this footage that these kids had put on YouTube of like smashing a PS4 <laughs> and I made it all black and white and grainy. And I called it like this was the Liberation Day of, you know, and so so he gets his wish. He wins the console war and he ends up all alone, though, because it's killed everyone and he's left to play the only video game he had loaded on his Xbox because the internet's down, which was Crackdown 3. So all he can play now <laughs> is Crackdown 3. And I think it really pissed Phil off because like the next day I was blocked and I'm like, dude, it's a joke. I don't dude, never it's play a joke. It's hilarious. I know. I, well, well, and he, also, he, I want to see, I want to see old TV it. series like, like this. I want to see the actual oh. console war become a console war. You know, I would love that. That'd be so hilarious. That. Oh my God. It, just, it should be like a documentary though. Like a, like people talking to the camera, it's like, oh, I was there the day it started. And then it kind of does the recreation and it goes back to all these talking heads about just how awful it was. And I thought the console war was just for kids. But then they told me that uh, if I played on the Xbox, I, I, I was against Donald Trump. So I picked up my rifle, you know, and all that kind of stuff would be great. Well, I also, also talking about cross promotion, uh, I'm, you know, Colin and I talked about this, about House of, House of Cards, about how uh, what's his face, Frank Underwood, was always playing yeah. PlayStation titles. Yeah, he loved PSP, Killzone. Right? He was Killzone. Yeah. Oh, there was one scene yeah. where he was actually trying to play God of War Ascension. Uh, yeah, I remember this. Yeah, and uh, the f the funniest part about that is uh, the Wi-Fi wasn't working. And so it's really, really funny to think about Frank Underwood logging onto his PlayStation 3 to play God of War Ascension multiplayer online only. Like he's not even there for this fucking single player. <laughs> That's pretty cool. They played DVD. Joey and uh who's the other guy? Joey and uh Chandler played Twist Metal 2. No shit. Uh, in Friends in the Thanksgiving episode of Friends. And then the one that blew my mind if you watch the social network um at the party at Zuckerberg's house uh, when I think it's when uh, Andrew Garfield shows up for the first time, he comes out to LA. A bunch of them are sitting around playing Twist Metal Black split screen. Uh, oh, on, I gotta check that out. Yeah, yeah and I, was, and I showed my kid. My my kids don't care. I thought they would be so impressed, and they're like, eh. "I'm like, that's Zuckerberg." Facebook, look, he knows what Twist Metal is. Eh. Where's Roblox, Dad? Fire up Roblox, you old fucking fossil. <laughs> yeah, the real metaverse, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well. I appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to me and uh, Gene, thanks for, yeah, I hope you got you all your guys. questions in. I hope I didn't. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, to, to tag along. You know, I, I figure, you know, I, again, I, I was, I was there. So I feel like it'll be a good use of my resources. And my it's always good to see along. Gene the bean. Yeah. It's been a Come minute. On. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And it's nice to actually talk about video games as, as opposed to, you know, fucking our, our past and strip clubs or whatever. Yeah, yeah so, sure. There's yeah. a place and there's a time and a place for that as well. But um, yeah. did you ever go to a strip club with your significant other? 
Yeah. Uh, would I have or have I ever I have, have? I have. It wasn't what I. It wasn't I what it was cracked. No, up I, to I, I. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, I'm not into that scene generally. It's. I'm not either. Yeah. But I thought, well, this will be fun, and she thought, well, this will be fun, and it was just okay. Because what are you going to do? I mean, it's, it's hard. To- it's great. It's the best because because the girls, the, the dancers feel more comfortable because you're with a girl. So that's you can a, get away with more problem. shit. You know? That's a you problem, Gene. You can get away with, they, they you, you totally get away with Lizzo levels of shit. You can just put bananas <laughs> like wherever you want. You know? <laughs> I want to tell you something else. Um, the idea of going to strip clubs, though, like when I was with Sony, it's like, hey, after E3, let's all go to a strip club. The last thing I want is to be sitting there with a fucking giant erection because it's big. Um, a giant <laughs> erection. With a bunch of guys sitting around. I mean, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no. it's, it's always funny you say that because my first E3 in 2002, a bunch of buddies, I was working for a small site. A bunch of buddies came over to E3 and they were like, well, what should we do, Gene? Like, this is your town because this is what, when I lived in LA. And I was like, let's go to the strip club, baby. And so I took Which them, one did you go to? Live Live Nude Nudes? No, the Spearman, the, the Spearman Rhino. Spearman Rhino. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I took them to yeah. the place with like the fucking $20 cover charge and everything. And yeah, I mean, we, we <laughs> ended, we ended for the night. Out. Huh? Keep the riffraff out with the twenty. Exactly. Yeah. Charge. Yeah. Exactly. The, the, the gamer is infiltrated. You know. So I'll tell you what. I've had some experiences with that. I I had. Uh... <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Listen. Shh. I can just That's tell just you. I didn't, know what a, <laughs> I didn't know what a golden shower was, but I do now. <laughs> oh I don't like God. it. I don't like it. I'm like, well, what's going on? She's like, oh, I'm going to pee on you. No, no, you're not. Okay, I've no. never had that before. So Yeah, I, it was yeah. for my birthday party. Boy, I'll tell you, we were at USC, and I hired my best friend strippers, two strippers, and they were, I mean, I'm stunned we're not all sick or dead in terms of what they would do with you. <gasps> and then so my friend returned the favor, and <laughs> and they set up this pool, like a baby pool, like a kid's pool from Walmart in the middle of the dorm suite, and they're like, okay, you sit in that. I'm like, oh, are we going to jello wrestle or what is this? And she's like, no, I'm going to pee on you. Come on. Now. Come on now. What, why? I mean, if you're into that, kid. I'm not kink shaming, yeah. but I don't want your urine on me. Yeah. That's um, not my thing. But William yeah. Friedkin died yesterday. I saw that. Yeah. He, he wanted his wife to shit on him. <laughs> Cleveland steamer. <laughs> it's, ter- it's terrible. I was like, yes, that's at the end. I directed Exorcist, French Connection, Guardian, Sorcerer, one of the greats of the 70s. And the first thing I thought when I saw William Freakin died was that's the guy who was married to the news anchor in LA and she used to shit on him. <laughs> really? Well, wait, wait, which news anchor in LA? Now I'm not uh, go look it up. Anyways. Look it up. <laughs> I'm Gene Park of the Washington Post. Today we're going to talk about William Freakin and Fecal Pace running down his eyes. Anyway, fellas, it's been fun. It, it was. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Anytime. <laughs> Thank you guys out there for your love, kindness, and support. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back for Twisted Metal 2. And of course, we're going through the show as well. We'll have two more episodes for that. We're going to do episodes 3 through 6 and then 7 through 10. Um, and uh, we're enjoying it. So a lot more Twisted Metal to come. Until next time. Goodbye. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.